The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 852 for Monday, January 11th, 2021. Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App. The show where you send in all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found. We go through them all. We try to answer all your questions. And then we build an agenda where we share your tips. We share your questions. We share our answers. We share your cool stuff found. The goal is that every single one of us, you, me, him, her, them, everybody, learns at least five new things each and every time we get together. Five. That's right. Uh Sponsors for this episode include some new ones and uh, some favorites. Tubird.com, uh, which is, I can't wait to tell you about this. One inbox is from the people that made notability. Anyway, yes, Tubird.com, uh, a, a returning sponsor, audible.com slash MGG, where you can get a 30-day trial of Audible Plus. Amazon Pharmacy at Amazon.com slash MGGRX. Uh, which is uh, very cool. I've actually got some people using it, which is, and it's amazing. And then uh, headspace.com slash MGG, which I've been using and is amazing. So uh, we'll talk more about each of those shortly here. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Trifle, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are we today, Mr. John F. Braun? Uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, as well as can be expected. Pandemicking like bosses. That's what, that's the answer. I think, I don't know. <laughs> nah. well, Though I not? do try to get out at least, at least once a day and have limited interaction with. Right. Yeah, it's good. We've been doing a lot mostly of machines, but yeah, we've been doing a lot of hikes and, you know, walks around the neighborhood and those sorts of things. So. It is good to get out. That's good. Hey, uh, quick tips today. Some actually some great. I, I love quick tips. So when I say they're great ones, it's it's me saying how much I like them. Uh, Mike brings us one. He says, uh, playing around, I discovered something that I have not heard discussed on the show. And I certainly didn't know. He says, using spotlight on the Mac to do quick math, press the return key any time after entering one number and a calculation symbol. Uh, and it opens the calculator app with the values from Spotlight. He says, looking around in the calculator app, it does conversions of 11 different types, money, weight, distance, and much more. Who knew? He says, I didn't. Yeah, there's all kinds of things in the calculator app, but you're right. You can, A, I think even Mike's premise is it, in and of itself a quick tip, that if you did not know that you can pull up Spotlight on your Mac and do calculations right there inside Spotlight. It is the most handy calculator I've ever had in my life. And I use it constantly. And Mike's right, hitting enter, uh, once you've done that and you know sort of gotten Spotlight into calculation mode will bring all of that, whatever you've done thus far, it brings it into the calculator so you can mess with it from there. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Right? Well, I do use it. Though I do use it as a calculator regularly when I'm uh, calculating uh, how much money I have to transfer between accounts to pay my bills, I sure. use that. But I didn't know that hitting return would yep. pop you into calculator. It pops you That's right in, nice. and and brings yeah. your most recent results with you. So you you know it, you're it like the mm -hmm. workflow is just seamless. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's I appreciate you yeah. sharing that, Mike. It's good. And I also use it as an app launcher. Oh, Spotlight's the best app launcher too. I, I've tried to use some of the third party ones that that extend on what Spotlight does, but I, I don't know. I guess I started using Spotlight first and you know, old dog new tricks, old habits, you know. There you go. So all right. Mr. Braun, we hear you breathing. So tell us your your quick tip. Ah, uh, yes. So um Yeah, I'm still alive. Um That's good. <laughs> so uh we uh in lieu of a uh, there was a string of messages that I was getting. Uh, we have a, a small group that we defined, I think, last CES. Um, and all of a sudden, it started popping up uh, alerts on my screen and on my computer. And it was bothering me because I didn't want to be interrupted. So I was like, how do I make this stop? And here's how you make it stop. So I, I didn't know I could do this, but you can. So I went into messages on my phone. 
uh, did a long press on the thread and a number of options come up. And one of them was hide alerts. So I hid the alerts. You hid the alerts. That's great. And, and was not disturbed anymore. And did so that, only- does that sync with your other devices? Like once you hid the alerts on your phone for that thread, did it also yes. hide them on your Mac? Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay, cool. That's good. Yeah. My only complaint, I, I, I've experienced that too. And it, you know, it's often when we're recording the show that like my family group text or any of the group texts that I'm in will just suddenly blow up. Right. You know, d- two people start interacting and then suddenly it's four people and, and you know, it's great. Unless like you said, you're in the middle of something and you're like, I don't want this. Um, I have taken to just doing do not disturb on my Mac because I know that that will expire after 24 hours when I do do not disturb. And I do that uh, repeat quick tip option click on the notification center or the control center. um, And that will do it. I'm still on Catalina here in the studio. So I'm thinking Catalina, but, but, uh, but the nice part about that is it will, it, when you do that, it auto expires after 24 hours and your alerts come back with what you're describing in messages and really all of messages functionality. When you mute alerts, in messages, they are muted on that thread until you unmute them. And there is no reminder, of course, that you have a thread <laughs> muted. And so I, I found that to be dangerous. It depends. I mean, if it's a thread that's not like urgent or anything, then whatever. But, uh, but I don't, I don't like that. There's no mute this for an hour. Facebook messenger does that correctly. In my opinion, y- you know, you can, it'll, when you go to mute a conversation, I think they call it do not disturb, but, uh, when you go to mute it, it's, you know, it asks you, do you want to do it for an hour, a day, I think a month or a week, I don't know. There's, there's several presets or forever, but you can choose one of the not forever options. And I like that, but you can't do that in messages. So just beware. I feel like it's, you know, set a mute it, but right. then set yourself a reminder for a week from now to not forget to turn it back on. So. Right. And actually another thing I found too. So the, my latest iPad, um, um, its behavior is different from prior iPads. Um, so the other thing that was happening is my iPad was making noises when these messages were coming in. And I didn't think that that should have happened because I turned the volume all the way down and it was still making beep beep noises really? when messages were coming in. And I'm like, that's annoying. Apparently what you have to do on the latest iPad or ones without a switch is you actually have to go into sound and change the volume of, uh, I think it's system sounds. I don't have it in front of me. Is there a way? But having the, having the volume down is separate from having the volume down will not prevent system sounds. That's a separate setting. Yeah. I seem to remember, and I don't think this is unique to the iPad, but it might be. I, I, I thought that this was the same in, the phone too that that like on the phone you can go into uh, settings sound and haptics and and you can set the ringer and alerts and either change that with the buttons or not change that with the buttons if you don't want your ringer and alert sounds to be uh you know messed with in that regard so i i feel like i feel like i've set my ipad to 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 sync the volumes between the two and so maybe mm-hmm. maybe there's a setting i don't have an ipad in front of me while we're recording so i i'm, I'm not i'm I, I just yeah i think on on the ipad i think it's it's just alert it's not ringer because i guess the ipad doesn't have a ringer so uh yeah fair fair right yeah okay all right so all i thought right. i'd share that one yeah time. no that's good yeah yeah if you have any any if you folks have any details to add to that feedback at macgeekab.com would be the uh, the place to do that. All right. So did you say feedback at MackieGap.com? I did say feedback at MackieGap.com. Uh, just, just making sure. No, it's good. It's good to make make the shtick. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Mike, different Mike, brings us yet another quick tip. And that is, if I can archive the first mic out of the way, uh, I bet this was there in the past... And I was oblivious. But in iOS, when pulling down Control Center, there's a large button that says HomeKit Favorites. And as expected, when tapped, it opens a Favorites panel. I've used it hundreds of times. I finally noticed today 
that the down arrow or Chevron or twistable triangle, whatever it is, next to the word favorites is a disclosure button. And when tapped, it allows drilling down to particular rooms so you're not stuck with favorites. That's already been handy for me. He says, previously, I tapped the home kit icon at the top right, moving me to the home app and then choosing the rooms that I wanted. That's less handy. Yeah, I had no I, I, I was in the same boat as Mike that I would if I wanted to control something that wasn't in my particular favorites list right there, I would have to jump to the home app and you don't. It's it's all right there. So thank you for that, Mike. That's great. I, I wish I could rely on HomeKit more. I, I, my problem is, of course, most of my accessories are not HomeKit compatible, so I'm using Hoobs or HomeBridge, um, and I'll put links in the show notes to both of those. But on my Synology to uh, to you know make that link between non HomeKit things and HomeKit itself, and it works, but it's just a little bit. You know, it's a it's a bridge that sometimes fails because there's third party plugins that cause it to crash. And then it's like, oh, yeah, right. I don't have it. So it's fine for controlling things manually like we're talking about here. I I can't because of that. I can't bring myself to rely on HomeKit for automation. So I still use the a lady for all my automations and that works fine. So but anyway, just figured I'd throw it out. Hey, um, speaking of. Home kit and automations and all that stuff. I stumbled onto a thing that I wanted to share. It's it, we'll call it a quick tip. It, if you have outdoor lights that are controllable by your whatever smart home you have, so this would work for home kit with Siri or you know, Amazon with the A Lady or, or Google or whatever. Um, we so last night th th this tip will, will be helpful for you. Maybe maybe there's another way too because if you've just got something outside. Uh, last night we did actually we did a great thing. We we created a little family event. We uh, early evening we did another one of our uh, Airbnb online experiences. This one was with Ferdia, uh, a master bartender from London, and the name of the class was Rum Cocktail Masterclass with a Pro. Truly a pro. He he's like the geek of bartending and his enthusiasm is infectious. I highly recommend it. So we did that and learned so much. It was amazing. And then um, we did uh, DoorDash for dinner because we wanted to do takeout, but we knew that we were going to be doing this rum class and probably wouldn't be a good idea to be driving and going to pick up takeout. So it was like DoorDash. Great. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we use DoorDash and when you do DoorDash, if you haven't done it before, you tell the driver how to uh, how to find your your house. Right. It, it, you know, and, and like give it some identifying characteristics. You might see where this is going. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. I can make my outdoor lights different colors. And not only can I make them different colors, I can make the one by the door yet another color. So they know exactly what door to like find the little table that I have set up outside for them to put the stuff on. And I thought, and it, it saves this, right? Because I had done this the last time. It saves this in DoorDash. So you just, you know, the instructions are the same no matter who your restaurant is or your dasher is or whatever. And I thought, wait a minute, I need to put a scene into, you know, for us, the, the A-Lady, but it, you could put it into to Siri or whatever that sets my lights to the DoorDash thing. And then I can say, Hey, S lady DoorDash. And then boom, my outside lights are the colors that are going to match the description I've previously written into my DoorDash profile. And now that person's going to be able to find your house. No problem. And, uh, and, and they, they like, they appreciated it the last time the woman, you know, texted us last night after she came last night and dropped her stuff off. And, um, and it was, and she was like, this is great. So set up your DoorDash profile. And then John, uh, after we ordered DoorDash, you know, it's Saturday night, busy, took about an hour, which is fine. Um, Sky, my daughter was like, we should do an Apple fitness uh, dance class. I had not done any Apple fitness stuff before. I've done online workout things that we did actually as a family together and, uh, you know, back in the spring, but I had not done any fitness plus things. So we did a fitness plus dance with LaShawn throwback hits. And I'll put the link in the thing, 20 minute dance class. It was great to sweat. And like, you know, move after sitting and drinking rum and various other things uh, for, you know, an hour and a half or whatever. And it was a great way to kill the time while we waited for DoorDash to show up. They do a fantastic job with Fitness Plus. I realize I'm a little late to, to this party by a few weeks, but um, 
but I highly recommend it. It's, it's all, you know, it, it felt very comfortable and I am, I mean, I'm a drummer, so, uh, you know, uncoordinated, in, intentional uncoordination is the name of what I've been pursuing for 30 years. I am not a dancer is, is what I'm trying to tell you. And this was a blast. We had a blast. My heart rate was up over 130 at 20 minute class. And that's the beauty of fitness plus is like, the, I think the longest one you can do is 45 minutes, but there's, there's mostly just short ones and you could string them together. If you want a longer workout, uh, you certainly can. And you know, you do it alone or we did it with the family. Uh, but, uh, you know, my daughter, I mean, we've, we've invested a lot of money to make her a great dancer. She took dance classes for years. Uh, she's a great dancer. The rest of us are not, but it didn't matter. It was just a good little fun, fun workout and fun way to move. So I highly recommend it. And then one last thing, John, I will share because <laughs> I had never heard this phrase before, but when we were on with Ferdia doing the Airbnb thing, you know, he, they, they, as they, as the host should, they try to get to know you. And so we were talking and he asked, you know, about the, what do I, what do I do for work? And I told him we do the show and he's like, oh, he's like, I need to listen. He, he wrote down the name of the show. So welcome Ferdia, uh, nice to Ferdia. Sorry. Uh, nice to have you as a listener. Uh, and he said something that I loved. He says, I have all he now you have to understand Ferdia works at the Savoy in London. So he's, and he's, you know, from UK. So he's got a fantastic British accent. Uh, and he, uh, he said, uh, he said, I have all the gear, but no idea. And I love that phrase. He says they use that for people like in sports who have like all, you know, the, the, the best, whatever, the best shoes, the best, whatever, but you know, can't actually play. So he says, he's got all the gear, but no idea. And, uh, and that's what we do here. We take you and we, we give you all the ideas. So, you know, we turn, turn us in, turn everybody into a geek, make everybody comfortable with their tech. So that's what we do. So anyway, but set up your, uh, your Siri for a, a DoorDash thing. If you're using that even infrequently, because it can make life, you know, way easier. Right. I don't know. Have you done any DoorDashing, John? Nope. Okay. It's, it's, they do it. It like we've had, I don't know, we've done it four or five times in the last month or so here. And it's been, it's fantastic. It really is. It's great. Um, so yeah, no, I usually go and, uh, go and pick it up. Mm. No, actually I seem to recall. So I've been uh, doing a Panera bread as a okay. plate, and you can go yeah. and, you know, grab your stuff off the shelf. Sure. But, um, I seem to recall that when one of my screens was up, it, made a suggestion that that I should make a shortcut to to launch their app because it noticed I guess that I was launching the app a lot sure so that was kind of neat yeah 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 no Siri will figure that out yeah yeah and it it knows like tries to, to know contextually what you know when it should offer those those things to to launch or whatever so yeah what was another one so I usually check a certain stock and I think at one point it also said oh you want me to uh yeah. You want me to make a shortcut so you can check the price of uh, your stock. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Smart. But I didn't do it. I like it. Though I probably should. Yeah. I don't really use uh, S lady that often. Interesting. Well, yeah. And I mean, you don't have to, those shortcuts can be done with tapping, not just with speaking mm. too. Right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey, uh, we have some questions uh, airdrop questions, archiving questions about a technology I'd never heard about before. And then I think we've got some Wi-Fi stuff and some cool stuff found we hope to get to. So, uh, so yeah, lots to do. And uh, the next thing I want to do is talk about our first two sponsors, if that's okay by you, Mr. Braun. Please do. All right. Our first sponsor here is TwoBird, which is a web app at TwoBird.com or an app that you can download for your iPhone and it's from the makers of Notability, right? That, that great note-taking app that we all use. But what TwoBird is, is it is a consolidated inbox that brings together all your notes, your reminders, your calendar entries, collaboration utilities, and, of course, your email. And TwoBird was built with the same philosophy as Notability. Powerful, yet simple. The idea here is that constantly switching from an email to a document or a chat app or a calendar wastes time 
and it distracts your focus. Think about when you move to your calendar. You see all the other things on your calendar, right? You're in an email. You want to put an event on the calendar. You go to the calendar. Uh Uh-oh, now you're exposed to your calendar and all the distractions that come with that, right? That wastes time. TubeBird helps by giving you context where you already are. Edit a note right inside of a conversation. Set a reminder for anything in your inbox. It's really clean and lets you focus on the content that matters without distracting signatures and complex formatting and all of that stuff. And of course it works in dark or light mode. (laughs) Even best, it's free to download immediately on the Apple app store, the Google play store. It's for Gmail users globally and Microsoft users soon. And one thing I will point out, Tuber doesn't change your email box in any way. So you can go and experiment with Tuber while still leaving your existing workflow exactly as it is. And in fact, you could bounce back and forth if you like, and, and you're going to be good. So go check it out. Tuber.com and our thanks to Tuber for sponsoring this episode. All right, look, and now I get to tell you about one of my other favorite apps. Even in the new year, it's hard to start a new routine, right? But if you're one of the 34% of Americans who made a resolution to be less stressed, Headspace is here to help because Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in their super easy to use app. I love Headspace. I've been using it for years. And then when they came on board as a sponsor, it was like, oh yeah, I got to get back into this every day. And it's so, what's so cool about it is That Headspace is there if you're an expert meditator, they're there if you've never meditated before, they've got a path for anyone. And really, meditation, it's called a practice for a reason. You keep practicing. It's just how it works. But what's cool is Headspace has something for any time of day, anything I want, right? Like if I want some long, like 20 minute meditation, great. If I want something longer, great. But if I just want like a three minute SOS meditation, great. If I want some help falling asleep, they've got wind down sessions. It's awesome because Headspace's approach to mindfulness can help reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well being. And you deserve to feel happier. And Headspace is meditation made simple. So go to headspace.com slash MGG. That's headspace.com slash MGG for a free one month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. That's the best deal offered right now. So head to headspace.com slash MGG today. And our thanks to Headspace for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Let's go to David. David says, uh, he says, I have suddenly discovered a problem on my Big Sur Mac with the contacts app. For some reason, there are two instances of the app in my applications folder. Clicking on the most recent version launches contacts, whereas launching the second iteration only places the contacts icon in the dock, but does nothing other than that. I've tried the following to no avail. I've tried deleting the ghost application. Mac OS won't allow it. I've tried sudo going to the terminal, sudo rm to remove it. Mac OS will not allow it. I've tried launching in safe mode, hoping that that was a cache problem and that would solve it. It did not. Finally, as a last resort, I wiped both the system and data partitions and installed a fresh copy of the OS from a USB drive and data from my time machine. That did not solve the problem. Any ideas about what's going on? So my thought uh, for for David here, which worked, was booting into recovery mode and attempting the deletion from there. Uh, you know, I, I whenever we get your questions in, the way John and I approach them is, you know, what would we do if we were there? We don't always necessarily have the answers, but, you know, it's like, okay, if we're forced to, if the option of doing nothing is not an op is taken off the table. All right. What's left. <laughs> right. You know, so, so that's kind of where we go. And, um, he said that did the trick. He says, oddly enough, when I looked at the applications folder in recovery mode, there was only one instance of the app. He says, I still went ahead and deleted it knowing I could always restore if everything went awry. When I rebooted, everything looked fine. And this is the interesting part and in how he got two instances of a Mac OS app. So one was truly in his applications folder. The other one, remember, we're on Big Sur, which it, starting with Catalina, APFS, two volumes merged together, the system volume and the data volume or the, 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 the main volume and the data volume. But the system volume is read only. And where your 
Applications that are built into macOS Live is not in the Applications folder. When you see them in the Applications folder, it's the result of a magic little merge with those firm links that Apple has in the background. Where they are actually stored is in System Applications. And then APFS does that magic and pulls them in for you. So you see them in applications, but they're not there. This is why when you went to delete it, you couldn't because Mac OS thought you were trying to delete the one that was from the firm link. It was a little confused, obviously, but there was no way for you to tell it that without being in recovery mode. So my, I, I mean, my guess is somewhere in your time machine backup, you have a contacts app. It can happily copy it into Mac OS or into slash applications because there is no contacts app there except once it gets merged in, uh, you know, once you log in and all that stuff. So, so yeah, interesting little, interesting little tool. I don't know, but any, any, does this trigger any thoughts, John, any, anything to say about this? Uh, you are muted, my friend. I cannot hear you. I don't know if you, I don't have you muted here, but I don't hear you. No, you okay. I, I great. muted myself. Great. Uh... <laughs> great, great, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, I just thought that was really interesting that, you know, he would see both of them and yeah, I guess Mac OS, I mean, it's the, this is one of those edge cases, right? Where Mac OS, Apple engineers don't expect you to have an app called contacts in your applications mm -hmm. folder and they've never run into it because they know you're not supposed to have an app called contacts. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just one of those things. So yes, yes. All right. Uh, moving on, Mr. Braun, please. Michael asks, he says, I'm lucky to be the owner of a new iPad Air. Thanks, John. He says, you made me do it. Uh, he says, I used my iCloud backup from my previous Air and most things came over fine, but not, as you'll see below my email signatures. Is there a reason for this? How do I get them back? Um, so this is, you know, the, the zooming out, this is an iCloud syncing problem, uh, it, at least as I'm approaching it here, John. And what I've found with iCloud is that when the symptom is that something isn't syncing to a new device, generally that means that the problem is that something isn't syncing from the old device, right? Uh, it, because generally iCloud, especially on a new device, has no trouble pulling down whatever's in the cloud to the machine. So this would tell me most likely could be wrong that whatever's in the cloud is what you're seeing, which is nothing. So I would recommend there's no way online. Well, maybe there is, maybe you can go in and see your email signatures in the mail app in iCloud.com, but I don't think you can. Um, what I would do is I would make a change to your signature on on the Mac that that has it and see if that forces a sync around. If it doesn't save that signature somewhere. I mean, you probably have it saved in your sent box in the form of a signature at the bottom of thousands of emails. So you've got it. I would make a change to the blank signature on your new iPad and see if that syncs around and blows away the one on your Mac. And that might, you know, kind of free up the syncing wheel, if you will, and get everything working again. So that that's, you know, if I were there, that's the next thing I would do. What would you do, John? Any thoughts? Uh, sometimes logging out of and logging back into iCloud, I found gets things moving again. Yeah. I haven't had to do it often. And sometimes it's scary because you get some messages like, oh, everything's going to disappear. Or it's gonna... Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they've reduced those scary messages, but I, uh, I had to do that once on on my iPad, I think, mm. because he yeah, has some things weren't happening that I thought should be happening. Right, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, craziness. I don't know, man. Like, it, you know, iCloud syncing is definitely one. Syncing is hard. Uh, and Apple uh, is is not immune to having syncing problems, especially because Apple likes to obscure all of the nitty gritty from us, uh, which we appreciate right up until moments like this when it's like, I, but I, yeah, I want to dig in. I, I would love if there was an iCloud syncing uh, diagnostic tool. And I guess, I guess as I'm saying that out loud, there sort of is from Howard Oakley over at the eclectic light company. And I'm trying to make, is it Cirrus? I think that would be the one, right? Right. 
Yeah. Cirrus like the cloud. Cirrus like <laughs> the cloud. Yeah. It investigates and diagnoses iCloud problems. So yeah, that we'll put a link to Cirrus in there because if, if either of the things you and I are talking about didn't work, I think Cirrus is where that's, that's, that's what certainly what came to mind next. So that's where I would go next. So yeah, there you go. All right. Anything more on that, John, before we're moving on? Mm -hmm. Herbert says, I have a number of spindles of burned DVDs and CDs of various video, photo, and audio projects that I've done over the years. All of it is also on either hard drive or on my Synology disk station. I'm still a belt and suspenders type, though. I always burn off uh, my raw and work files to disk as a backup. I was reminded recently of how fragile the dye-based media are because of unstable chemistry and oxidation. So I began researching ox uh, options. Uh, he says that I plan to replace my aging 2007 iMac this year with a new, hopefully M1 or even M2 iMac. I will need a new optical burner. I've been looking at the OWC Mercury Pro 16X Blu-ray, uh, which includes M-Disc burning. Granted, we certainly don't have the long-term data yet to either confirm or disprove the thousand-year claim of M-Disc, but I can't find anything really negative about the tech. Every review I've read seems to be rather positive about the durability of the media, and I have not come across anything negative that would put me off the M-Disc as a solution, certainly as a better solution than standard dye-based burning like CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays. I certainly would appreciate any thoughts that either of you might have. Yeah, I had never heard about M-Disc before, John, and uh, and so I, I figured I'd bring this up and we'd either, maybe you have, or maybe um, maybe one of our listeners has, so... It's, it's, it's a, it's a media format. Oh, it's a media, um, like you would still burn as a DVD or Blu-ray, but the, the makeup of the chemical makeup of the media, I guess, is the, the materials are different. And they say that in Wikipedia, they say that MDisc, the exact properties of MDisc are a trade secret. Patents protecting it assert that the data layer is a glassy carbon and that the material is substantially inert to oxidation and has a melting point between 200 and 1000 Celsius. So yeah, thousand year shelf life sounds perhaps realistic. I don't know. Have you, had you heard anything about this, John? No, no, I'm, I'm looking at their description. And so, yeah, rather than using dyes, which degrade over time, as you mentioned, they say they use a rock-like material, which I guess you just kind of said that too, or, or the Wikipedia yeah. page says it's like a carbon-based. Yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess with their testing, they project a thousand years. Obviously, nobody knows yet. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they've also built a time machine and maybe that's, maybe mm -hmm. they built the time machine first. And that's how they were able to get this glassy carbon right, technology, right. right? They went into the future and slurped it back with them. I don't know. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know. These are the way the thoughts go in my head, folks. Uh, yeah. All right. Anything? Uh, anything? I'm sorry. I just looked in our chat room at, at, at live.macgeekab.com and I saw Warren's comment. DoorDash, disco lights, and dancing sounds like a party. We needed the disco lights. I definitely could have and should have like done the lights in the living room to to be a little more party like. But uh, but you know it's all good. Well, one of your um, doesn't one of your uh, uh, JBL uh, speakers? Yeah, they have a light show on those. Yeah, the JBL Pulse. Yeah, it does. I, I but we were using our you know living room our big. LG TV and the Sonos mm. sound. So it just was all like right there. We didn't think we just turned it on and went. It is cool. The way fitness plus um, when you launch it on the Apple TV, when you launch the app on the TV, it brings up a, a list of all the Apple watches that it sees in the room uh, and or nearby, I suppose. And you pick the one you want. And then that's the one that shows up on the screen. They need to get the multi-user thing down with Fitness Plus for sure. So that you can have like when the four of us are working out, you can see each person can see their their watch synced with the with the TV. That would be good. But uh, but anyway, maybe the new M Disco thousand year lights says SSLS six in live.macecab.com. I like it. It's good. Uh, what does JP say, though? Gentlemen. JP with a 
airdrop question. Uh, I love airdrop and I use it from my all my devices to my main computer in my office. Sometimes I'll try and airdrop something and uh, my iMac will not show up uh, because it is asleep. Is there any way that uh, airdrop works where it'll wake the computer up and let me send files to it? Because if I'm sitting on the couch and I want to send a PDF or a picture over to my iMac for future filing, uh, I'd have to get up and go over there, wake, wake it up and uh, to get it to show up. So yeah. I have, uh, you know, I have all the settings correct. Wake for, uh, you know, uh, network uh, access and all that stuff. I just wondered, is there is there some trick that I'm not aware of, or is this the fate of the the great convenience of AirDrop with a huge asterisk next to it? Yeah. Thank you much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yes, you you are absolutely right. This is it's just not the way AirDrop is built to work, right? AirDrop is there to share files between active users of each device, and it's not really for beaming to an inactive device. In fact, certainly you can use AirDrop between your own devices, but really where it's built is to share things with other people in your vicinity, and the the way it works is you are not advertising yourself as an airdrop destination unless your device, be it an iPhone, a Mac or whatever is awake and unlocked. And then if again, if you know, and you can set airdrop security that allowing everyone or allowing no one or just people in your contacts list, but you know, for the people that should see that you are there, once your device is unlocked and awake, then you show up as an airdrop destination. And the same is true for your machines. It needs to be, awake and on, you know, nearby ish. And so that's what you're, that's what you're running into here is it's just not the way airdrop was built. Uh, at least as I understand it, I, of course I didn't build airdrop. Don't give me any credit for that. Um, but you know, you could always use normal file sharing, John, right? Um, it's clumsier, but it would work and it would wake up the machine and, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, of course you can't connect. Well, can you connect to a file sharing destination in the files app now? I, I, I do it with my Synology, but I don't know that you can like connect to an SMB endpoint. Can we, could that be done? I don't know. Connect to server. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So go into the files app upper right again, way clumsier than airdrop, but you know, connect to server and, uh, and then boom, you've got, you know, you could have your, your local, you know, whatever your iMac. Let's see if I type in iMac studio, no, not Stufio, studio dot local. Let's see. Will it, no, not local. I shouldn't be doing this while I'm trying to podcast here, John. Yeah. Connect as a registered user. Okay, great. Type in my name and my password. And I say that and, 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 and mm, it's waiting too long. So maybe not, but I think it would work. And it might not be imacstudio.local. That doesn't always resolve here. It might be like imacstudio-2.local or something. But yeah, it looks like that that would be the the trick. I don't know. Have you you got any thoughts on this, John? Uh, I'm surprised that in Energy Saver, you, there's a setting wake for network access, but I guess that doesn't pay attention to AirDrop. It's Yeah, because AirDrop is more of an announcing kind of thing than uh passive well it's also and it's just using wireless it's yeah right so this does right. work I, yeah it's using both bluetooth and wi-fi correct to to associate and then mm -hmm. send files that's right so i i did it i put, put in the right ad address for this i fat fingered the first one and uh and now i can see all the drives attached to this machine and my home folder and i bet i could even like no oh, no i can't make that a favorite really that's weird can I make that a favorite? Mm, no. Okay. Well, so it's still a little clunky, but you know, whatevs. Does it remember this at least? Yes. It remembers it in shared now. So that's pretty cool. If I eject it, 
Oh, now it goes away. Okay, I probably shouldn't have done that. Okay, anyway. Uh, so yes, you can do that in the files app from your iPhone. You can connect to an SMB um, endpoint, which is great. So yeah, it won't browse them. Or at least I couldn't get it to browse them and show me what it sees on the network. Uh, but you know, I am doing a podcast right now. So probably uh, wasn't paying as close attention to that screen as I might be otherwise. So yeah, there you go. John, speaking of my iPhone, especially now that I have it out, I'll, I'll get it back. I've noticed a weird battery thing that I want to talk about here. I have, I mentioned in previous episodes that I, I have noticed and dislike waking up realizing that my phone is at 80% and, or, you know, whatever, not a hundred percent. And it's been on charge all night long. And so I have turned off uh, the, if you go into settings for your iPhone, uh, you go into settings, battery, and you go to battery health and there's a little uh, slider there for optimized battery charging. And mm -hmm. I will read what it says because it's going to sound like perhaps this is the, the reason it's not, but we'll, we'll, we'll read this because it misled me for a while to reduce battery aging. iPhone learns from your daily charging routine so it can wait to finish charging past 80% until you need to use it. And I thought, well, there's my problem. And I wouldn't really notice this when I woke up. I would notice it four or five hours later when it's like, your phone's at 50%. It's like, why is my phone at 50? Like, what has been going on? It's like, oh, well, it's the start of the day at 80. Okay, or less even. So uh, the cool part is that if you go back one screen, so just settings battery, not battery health, you get to see either the last 24 hours or the last 10 days of what's been going on with your battery. And this is a cool thing. It's highly interactive because you can tap on in the last 24 hour screen, you can tap on an hourly window and it will show you what was happening there, which is cool, right? So lots of quick tips here, but it will show you when it, it, it sort of, um, uh, grays, it's all green, but it, it makes a light green haze over the time period when the phone is on charge and then a not light green haze when it's, when it's not on charge. And what I noticed, regardless of whether my battery health optimized battery charging thing was on or off, was that my phone would hit 100% every night when I told it to, and then it would dip off while the battery was on charge because I could see it in the little green window. And so it's like, why is it doing this? I turned the thing off. I turned it on and off again because sometimes that, you know, I thought maybe it's confused and maybe my phone is confused, by the way. I'm curious to hear from, from any of you on this. And then I thought, wait a minute. I am charging my phone every night on a Qi charger. Let's see what happens mm -hmm. if I charge with a lightning cable. So last night I charged with a lightning cable and I went into battery health and I set optimized battery charging. And what happened? My phone went to 100% and stayed at 100% all night hmm. up until when I pulled it off a of charge and even past that, obviously, because it, you know, it doesn't precipitate, you know, it doesn't drop to 95 the moment you pull it off charge. So it stays like you can see uh, uh, if you're looking at the video for this show, and I probably will do a separate video about this, but you can see last night, like it's a, 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 a solid 100% sits right there thing. And I took some screenshots of other, uh, days issues. Where are my days issues? How come I don't have all photos? Hmm. Maybe I don't have all these pictures that I thought I had. Oh yes, there they are. All right. Oh, cause they're in, but you can see, let's see like that, that, you know, it's in the charging realm, but starts to mm -hmm. drop off. And why is that? And I think it's because, I mean, the, the, the difference for me is that, Qi charging versus wired charging. And I think the phone can do a trickle charge and maintain that hundred percent with wired safer than it can with Qi. So it decides in its infinite wisdom that it should get it to, you know, whatever hundred percent by 3 AM and then just let it dive. Take a nose dive, man. You do you. It's all good. And, uh, and I, I didn't, I don't appreciate that. So I'm going to do more testing with this, but, uh, but it sure seems like plugging in doesn't suffer. Certainly on my phone, plugging in did not suffer from this last night. So I'm curious what everybody else finds out about this craziness, John craziness. I don't know. Have you, uh, do you, how do you charge at night? Do you charge chi or do you charge, uh, uh, what's um, no, I usually don't. 
charge my devices overnight. Isn't that interesting? Throughout the day when I need to. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. It's kind of chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. When, right. When, when yeah. It, it, it's low. <laughs> Yeah, when it gets down to like below 20%, that's when I, I charge it wherever I happen to be. Interesting. It's in the car. Yeah, right. Um, right, right. Yeah, but I typically, um, and this is the uh, 12 mini, right? The same same phone as you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I I typically get a day's, a day's use, which is surprising because it's a relatively puny battery. Um Oh yeah, no, it's yeah. a great, the battery life on it's great when I start the day at a hundred. I mean, but you know, starting mm-hmm. 20 or more percent off of a hundred, no bueno, man. Right, right. Yeah. And what's worse, this is the part that infuriates me, John, is that like the other night, so, you know, like I said, you can tap and see what the, uh, what the, uh, what you call it, the, what was happening in, in that hour. And I know what I was doing in that hour from, let's say, uh, looking here from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. the other day, I was snoozing. I was definitely not using my mm-hmm. phone. And my phone confirms that because when I tap on that hour, uh, it says screen on zero minutes. Great. OK. We also know it was on charge because I can see that in the, the little, you know, green haze that it puts over when it's on charge. I can also see that the battery was precipitously dropping, plunging towards its favorite 80 percent wake up moment. Uh, but I can see that screen off usage time was 56 minutes. Now, John, you and I know that there's 60 minutes in an hour. So up for it, it rested for four minutes, but it found that it should what it should be doing for 56 minutes was letting photos do something in the background. So I thought that was cool. It wasn't but it wasn't taking any charge from the, you know, from the cheap pad while it was deciding in its infinite wisdom to let photos run full steam for an hour. No wonder my battery, I wake up. I mean, if, if something like, can I choose what gets to use my phone and when, please? Maybe I need that. Um, mm-hmm. I should try this. I should try putting that low power mode uh, shortcut mm-hmm. on that we talked about, right? So that it will automatically keep it in low power mode, even once it charges above 80% and see if it sends photos into a tizzy overnight. Because maybe, I don't know, there's lots to learn here. I love this stuff. Okay, uh, we have some Wi-Fi questions to get to. We have some fun stuff to get to. And I want to tell you about our next two sponsors, John, if uh, if we're good on this one. We're good. All right. Our next sponsor is, well, it's not a new sponsor to us, but it's certainly been a while. We're happy to welcome back Audible to the show at audible.com slash MGG, or you can text MGG to 500500 to start your free 30-day trial over there. And Audible's got something new called Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you get full access to Audible's Plus catalog, which is filled with thousands and thousands of select originals, audiobooks, and podcasts, including ad-free versions of popular shows, as well as exclusive series. And Audible Plus connects you to tons of content that'll entertain, inspire, and inform. And it's easy to find just the right listen, whether it's comedy, romance, true crime, science fiction, fitness and wellness. What they're doing there is very, very cool. I I was checking it out, of course. You've heard about The Queen's Gambit? Well, you can go listen right there. Have you... (laughs) Have you heard about Ready Player Two, narrated by Will Wheaton? I mean, you're definitely going to want to check that out, right? And for something fun, A Christmas Carol. Yeah, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I know. I know the season has just passed, but narrated by, nay, performed by Tim Curry. This is worth taking a listen to. This is what you can go and get at Audible. So you got to go check it out. And like I said, go to audible.com slash MGG or text MGG to 500500. So that's pretty easy to remember, right? To start your free 30 day trial, go check it out. And our thanks to audible for creating audible plus and for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Amazon pharmacy. Look right now we want to avoid our outbound interactions as much as we can, right? And Amazon Pharmacy delivers your medication directly to your door. So there's no waiting in line at the pharmacy. There's no seeing other people at the pharmacy because you're not going to the pharmacy. You're staying at home. 
and it's super easy. You can have your doctor's office send your next prescription straight to Amazon Pharmacy, or you can even have Amazon Pharmacy contact your doctor and take care of it for you. And you can use your insurance because Amazon Pharmacy works with most insurance plans nationwide. And Amazon Prime members get free two-day delivery and save on prescription medication when paying without insurance. Very cool and super, super easy to use. I've got a family member that's using it, and he said it was like setup was simple, and and it just like starts happening right away. It's really, really great, and the way they coordinate with your doctor again, just simple medication delivered right to your door. You got to go check this out. And Amazon Prime members can save on prescription medication when not using insurance and get free two day delivery. Learn more at Amazon.com slash MGGRX. That's A M A Z O N dot com slash MGGRX. One more time Amazon.com slash MGGRX. And our thanks to Amazon Pharmacy for sponsoring this episode. John, I. I want to talk about some Wi-Fi stuff because we love Wi-Fi here, don't we? I do. I know you do. We And we use it. Like, it's it, how could we live without it? Uh, listener Tim asks, he says, when I set up my Synology router, it said to point all of the antennas straight up. The router is at one end of a small apartment. Would it be better to point some of them towards the other side of the apartment? Okay. So, um, I, I my answer is, I don't know anymore, uh, but I figured it was a good conversation to have. Back in the, you know, one antenna at a time days, uh, it was recommended to point one straight up and one straight out. Like, so you'd look like you were like signaling semaphore, right? Um, and that would get different planes covered, right? Not not airplanes. Sorry about the semaphore confusion. But, you know, different planes of of your your house covered. But now that routers are, you know, two by two or three by three or four by four and our devices are two by two, it starts to get a little iffy with one device connecting simultaneously to multiple antennas. And I'm sure there is a scenario, John, where in our homes it makes sense to get cute about aiming antennas, but without lots of gear and lots of knowledge about how to use the gear. So all the gear, but no idea. Right. Uh, I don't think we'd ever get there except maybe by accident. So, and I've heard from router manufacturers, like don't overthink this. You know, Apple was famous for burying their antennas inside their routers. Obviously all the mesh systems, uh, most of them anyway, bury their antennas inside the router. They aim them the way they aim them and it ain't up to you. Uh, but there are so, still some routers that have antennas. And the nice part about an antenna that is, that, that, extends away from the router is you can get less noise uh, there. It, uh, I mean, assuming that they're using discrete power supplies and stuff inside, uh, it is possible to get, you know, a, a cleaner signal because the antenna is further away from all of the other electronics that are making noise. So I think that's at least as I understand it, part of why companies like Synology and Netgear and Linksys and, you know, d I mean, you know, on the, Four by four higher end routers, standalone routers, especially the gaming routers, especially you're seeing separate antennas. Yes, it's probably for that reason, but I wouldn't get cute about aiming them unless you really know what you're doing. I'd aim them all straight up in the air and that's that. So, um, and also, you know, some of those routers, uh, um, you know, can either sit flat on a, like a tabletop or desktop or hang on the wall and in either case, you'd want to be able to aim the antenna straight up. So, you know, hence the ability for you to adjust. But I, I, all the instructions I've seen, John, have been straight up. I don't know. What, have you seen? What, what would you, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, back in the day when I did radio, um, low frequency, like CB and stuff like that, actually, the, the, the antennas would have both a horizontal and a vertical element. To your That's point. right. Um, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah like, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Look like a Christmas tree sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, higher frequencies, um, like Wi-Fi, which I guess is technically microwave. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you want to get directional, I think you really need a dish and you know, that 
Right. Ah. And actually, some of these uh, Bluetooth sniffers actually have, well, the ones like uh, have a tin can, make them very directional and can go uh, long distances. But um, just babbling here. No, um, you're right. If you want to prove, sense, yeah. it, 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 no, if you, it, if you want to prove to yourself, uh, it, you could do an experiment. Now, what do you need to do an experiment like this? Well, you could just change the antennas and, you know, maybe look in the airport menu and look at the signal strength and walk around. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, see if the orientation makes any difference. Uh, you may want to, the, the, though there's a tool that can do this for you, Dave. I haven't actually used it in a while. I actually should, especially since I did change my setup per your recommendation. I, uh, right. I had three, uh, or I had four, um, I had four Eros um, in my house, and that's probably overdoing it because it's only 1,200 square feet. Right. So um, I got rid of one of them, and everything is still running at, you know, the highest speed I get out of this uh, this particular unit. So right. That's good. Um, but there's a tool called NetSpot, and it does what is known as a site survey. Um, and basically it automates this process of collecting data. So you draw a map of your place and then you, um, you set it up and then you walk around and, um, and it will then at the end of the exercise, will show you a map and it shows the signal strength at various places that you marked. So I got to do this. Try that. Yeah. But I, but I get a sense that the, the, the router knows what it's doing. Right. Especially with the multiple, you know, I mean, some of these, like some, some of these neck ear ones that I've seen are crazy. They have like eight antennas, I guess, yeah. just to make sure they can yeah. reach everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Good call. I like it. I like it. It's good. Cool. More on this. You got, I, I can tell the gears no, are no. spinning. No, you sure? Okay. All right. No, we're good. Okay. All right. I like it when these gears spin. It's good. Uh, all right. Uh, sticking with, with this theme here, we'll go with David who says, uh, uh, Oh, you know, I kind of want to read the beginning of his question. So let me find him. I'm going to, I'm going to, I know I archived it earlier today. Uh, yes. Okay. So David says I have Xfinity 200, megabit service, which is usually fine for our needs. I purchased a Netgear CM1200 this year, cable modem. I have been using a TP-Link Deco for years, uh, about once a day, which is a mesh system, just for everybody knows. Once a day, my internet speed drops to an unaccept unacceptable level of 10 to 15 megabits per second down. If I restart the cable modem, the speeds spike back to normal. 160 to 240 is what he gets. I updated the Deco. Do I, uh, Deco's firmware, do I also need to update my cable modems firmware? And if so, how? Any other ideas to improve the browsing experience? Okay, so to I want to answer his questions about updating the cable modem because this does apply to all of us. You, Your cable modem does receive firmware updates. It has the ability to, at least anyway. Uh, you do not, and I do not, have the ability to update the firmware on my cable modem. That is up to our cable companies to do. Uh, because the firmware update also comes with a profile that tells the cable modem how fast to let data flow in and out of your house. And so if we could get in there, you know, we could adjust those without paying for it. And they don't want us to do that. So that's part of it. But they handle firmware updates. Uh, restarting your cable modem is a good way to trigger any pending firmware updates that might exist out there. So, uh, so just bear that in mind. Not a bad idea to restart your cable modem once a month, maybe to, to, you know, get any updates. Uh, but other than that, no, you don't get to, to do it. So going to his other question, any ideas to improve our, our browsing experience? And this has, this has created an opportunity for lots and lots of back and forth here. And now I can't find David's original question, which has some of my notes in it. Oh, there's, um, but you know, the, He's got uh, lathe and plaster in his walls, which could be contributing to this. But again, it's intermittent, right? So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, if I were there, what would I do and how I would go about this, right? So 
clearly something is causing this. It's Wi-Fi, so we generally don't get to see what's causing problems uh, because we can't see Wi-Fi. At least I can't. Maybe you can. I don't know. Do you see Wi-Fi, John? Do your new glasses let you see Wi-Fi, man? No. Okay. Maybe we should pay extra for our glasses next time so we can see it. Make this a whole whole lot easier. Um, so it could be. So here's here's a little here's yeah. a little interesting nugget though. Um, you can see infrared if you have the right tools. That's many true. digital cameras, the uh, CCD or whatever image capture element. Yeah, a lot of them can see infrared. Um, it's kind of a fun exercise. Uh, get one of your IR remote controls and aim your digital camera at it and press the buttons and you may be able to see uh, infrared. But yeah, RF, no, I think uh, I actually have kicking around somewhere. I haven't used it in a while. Uh, you, you probably can, in a sense, see it if you have a uh, frequency oh, yeah. uh, analyzer. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I got I got one of those around here. Uh, I don't know if it goes up to 2.4 anyways, well, five, or five or six. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, okay. So yeah, well, but no, this is like, this is good. So digging in, we can't see it. So it could be interference from neighboring Wi-Fi, Right. And so it, it, if, again, if I were there, uh, I would run probably Wi-Fi Explorer. I just like the way it lays this particular screen out better than I stumbler, but I would use either one. They'll, but they both will convey the same information just in slightly different formats. And I would check to see what other networks are strong and on the same channels as yours, because that can cause issues, right? You know, there, there is a way of having Wi-Fi networks be near each other physically, but not near each other and overlapping in a channel sense. And, and so maybe there, maybe there, it would be good to know what the lay of the land is like. And Wi-Fi Explorer has a great view of this where it will actually layer all the networks it sees on a channel map. So you can see, ah, okay, there's, you know, five networks on, let's say take 2.4 for, for a moment, you know, five networks on channel one, four networks on channel six and only one on channel 11. Okay. Even if 11 is a pretty strong network, I'm probably going to go to that and test that because that might get us what we want, you, you know, and, and the same is true for the five gigahertz band as well. So, uh, so I would, I would definitely take a look at that. Um, and see, because that could cause this intermittent symptom, right? Uh, another thing that could explain the, the symptom is an issue with Xfinity, right? Like they might be having a daily outage for either your entire community or just you, right? Like there are some wires of theirs that are only for you. And maybe when things heat up or things cool down, whatever it is, that could cause some issues if they're kind of flaky, um, the test to this would the test for this would be to do an Ethernet based speed test dot net um, test so that you can see what data is going in and out. I also highly recommend setting up iPerf or iPerf three locally on your network so that you can test speed test only test your Internet connection. It 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 doesn't allow you to isolate your local network from the Internet, whereas doing iPerf just amongst machines locally for you does. So I would do that. Um, and that it's that kind of WAN versus LAN testing would be kind of my plan of attack of trying to make sense of why we're seeing the symptom we're seeing. Um, one last thing is, you know, my my favorite, what I call suite of three ping tests where I open three terminal windows and in each one I do a different ping. One is ping www.apple.com. One is ping 192.168.100.1, which is my cable modem and your cable modem. And then ping to whatever your router IP is. So for a lot of people, that's 192.168.1.1. But whatever your router's IP is, that's it. And you want to get all three of those going and let them run. A, get a feel for what's normal. You always want to know what does normal look like on each of these three. And then also, when there's an interruption, look at which of the three suffers the interruption simultaneously. If it's all three, then you have a problem on your local network, right? Because if your local network has an interruption and it cascades through, great. If it's only two, if it's the, you know, the Apple one and your cable modem, 
then you know you have a problem with your cable modem. And if it's just the Apple one, your cable modem and your router look fine, ping www.apple.com is having an issue, that's out of your hands completely because your cable modem's responding fine, but the connection to the outside world is not. That's when you can make a phone call to Xfinity. And the nice part is when you make that phone call, you've got some ground to stand on. You, you know, you can explain, hey, look, I've done this testing here. I know it's not my internal network. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm, you know, and inundate these people with, be nice about it, please. Everybody deserves some kindness and compassion these days, but don't be, don't hold back on the data that you have because you want to show them as efficiently as possible for your sake and theirs that you've done this testing. You have some data. There you go. So I don't know. That's my plan of attack on that kind of thing. John, what do you think? You are muted again. I don't know what's going on over there. Are you sitting on the mute? No, button? I mute myself so you don't hear my uh, my bottle. Oh, you're oh, when you oh you were drinking your your thing. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I didn't yeah. unmute. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, the only other thing I would check is the Doxis status page, and when you're having these issues, um, see if any of the values are out of spec. Or different from the others you you typically when you look at that status page you'll see the number of streams both downstream and upstream and then a whole bunch of values and just look to make sure they're correct um uh, and i think yeah we'll link to uh there, there's a page over at a uh, dsl reports i think that shows you the normal values yeah yeah okay right yeah 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 it should be Right. Looking at the values, but also looking at the logs in your Doxis status page, which is your cable modem status page. When we say Doxis status page, we mean your cable modem status page. Generally speaking, it's at the same right. the same URL for all of us. And it's 192.168.100.1. Just put that into Safari and it, it'll go there. We've got a link in the show notes that will link you to right. yours, not mine. Uh, it will link me to mine. Uh, or you'll link you to mine yeah. if you're at my house. So don't, mm -hmm. don't but don't come to my house right now. It's, it's bad. Yeah, and actually I'm looking at mine and yeah, so I have an event log and the only major thing it shows, oh, well, one of them, I think there was an outage at some point here. Yeah, because I see one here. So I see DHCP renew, which is normal, yeah. um, but no ranging response received. That's, that I think shows that they're having issues on their end. It yeah. doesn't come up too often. Sure. So that's okay. Sure. The other weird thing I'm seeing is one of my upstream channels has a different symbol rate from the others. Hmm. Okay. Let me want to cycle power on this. Yeah, one is at uh, 2560 kilo symbols per second, and then the rest of the upstream are at 5120. Huh. So why is that one upstream uh, slower? Hmm. That's interesting. Or maybe that that is normal. Actually, I got to... I got to look at a old screenshot and see if that is normal. Maybe that is normal. That That's the key is, one. yeah, no, you know, again, like what does normal look like? Yep. Uh, I'm trying to log into mine and I don't seem to have the, uh, I don't know. Isn't it just admin password for the Netgear ones? Yeah, it is. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it's now it's yelling at me for defaults. I was going to look at mine, John, and see if my upstreams are different than yours. Okay. So upstreams, I don't see signal rates on mine. So, hmm. I mean, I have different frequencies for each channel, obviously, but, uh, but I do not see signal rates reported. Yeah. On my net, well, my maybe that's channel. an Aris yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, fun. Let's do, uh, we've got a, yeah, we got some time left. Let's do cool stuff found. Shall we? Bruce. Mm -hmm. brings us, uh, he says, recently John talked about a terminal command for clearing the XATTR extended attributes in an app that would otherwise not run under Catalina or Big Sur. For people who like using a GUI instead, batch mod, B-A-T-C-H mod by Legente Software, sorry for mispronouncing anything, makes this super simple and easy. No memorization or terminal commands are required. And of course, we'll link to batch mod. But yeah, it lets you see and change and clear all extended attributes right there with a nice little screen that you can click on. So yeah, thank you, Bruce. Good. All right, John, you uh, CES week this week coming up. Uh, you've got a chance to check out some things. Tell us about one. Yeah. And uh, well, actually, this was. Uh, yeah, before. Um, 
I had never heard of these guys, and it looks like they have uh, a pretty killer cam doorbell. The The company is Nui, N-O-O-I-E. Have you ever heard of them? Nope. <sighs> okay. Uh, so they were showing what they call their cam doorbell, and uh, it really ha- looks like it has a good batch of features. Maybe I can have them beat me one. Uh, 2K camera, wide field of view, infrared, uh, human detection algorithm, uh, customizable sensitivity, uh, which is a problem with some doorbells and that they get a bit too sensitive. Uh, it's got a big honking 10,000 milliamp hour rechargeable battery. Um, uh, you can talk to your visitors or you can send a pre-recorded message. Uh, so that's the doorbell part. So it sounds like, mm. you know, good set of features. Then they have the base station component. Um, which is typical of a lot of these um, and the base station. So this is, this is the part that I really like here. So um, it, it pairs with a doorbell using some unknown uh, protocol <laughs> um, or I don't know what it is. Yeah. I should ask them. Kind of, kind of like the, um, the UFI the, one we talked about recently, right? Where it's the <clears throat> separate little base station thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, but it has 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, which is uh, a lot of these devices only have 2.4. So that's nice. Or Ethernet. So you can plug it into your Ethernet and, you know, really get some good throughput. Huh. Um, you can store. Vi- now, here's the nice part. You can store video, uh, HD video on your own micro SD memory card. Um, so that's neat. Uh, some other products, you have to buy a plan to store it. Yeah. In the- Right. Or and they have a cloud storage option if you want to if you want to do that. But if you have your own micro SD card, then you can put your video on that. So um, so it works with the the usual cast of uh, you know A Lady and G Lady. <laughs> um, and if you have an Echo Show, uh, which is a uh, Echo that has video yeah. on it, um, it'll actually throw up a notification on that device um okay show you what's happening too yeah so this isn't home kit but it is uh no uh, no, amazon and and google yeah okay all right cool cool right and it's 150 bucks which that's great i think they should charge more (laughs) that's great yeah cool all right we'll put a link to that in the show notes and john promises that before the show goes live he will have edited the article and removed all of the double spaces after periods because it doesn't read well with those what yeah, it, it reads badly because because we don't need those because our computer we're not using single spaced fonts, right? So you mm. the 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 um, rendering engine automatic in our browsers automatically knows to add extra space after a period, and adding extra extra makes the article seem jumpy. So John will remove that for us all. Um, cool uh, muscle nice. memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah. That's that's one of those those things that. That is. That's is what I learned. Days when gone I took by. Typing. Yep. Yeah. My, my Lisa. Uh, we all did, right? We all learned the the muscle memory of that. It's it, it that that is a, a habit worth worth um, reprogramming. It's it's a good thing for us mm. to exercise our neuroplasticity as as aging humans. So, uh, Jeremy brings up a cool stuff found. Jeremy, where are you? Jeremy is here. Uh, Reading the latest issue of Wired, I saw this device that looks so much like air power that it is striking. It is the Nomad Base Station Pro. Uh, and he says, interesting that they could pull it off when Apple couldn't. And it it does look interesting. It, it It's a $200 device. It's a pad that you put your, um, you know, your devices on and it charges them. So there you go. Nomad Base Station Pro. We'll put that, uh, we'll put that right there in the show notes. So thanks for sharing, Jeremy. It looks, that looks pretty cool. Huh? Yeah. Huh. Of course, earlier this episode, I was realizing that maybe I don't want to be charging my phone via Qi because it's, it's not happy about it, but yeah, they've got, it looks like they've got three Qi coils. Oh no, they've got multiple Qi coils throughout this thing. And it sort of triangulates on where they are. It really is full surface charging. They say they're back ordered until January 27th. So there you go. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Good stuff. Cool. Uh, John, I am breathing clear or air here in my studio. Uh, at, well, and at times my office, thanks to the Sensi Bow uh, pure Wi Fi controlled air purifier which is I've used other Wi-Fi air purifiers over the years, John, and they've driven me crazy 
because like the molecule one falls off the Wi-Fi network all the time. In fact, so much so that it, it really doesn't book. There's YouTube. I see you talking, John, but I don't hear you. And I'm not sure why that is. Uh, you want to reconnect yourself to me, John, now that I'm back up and running, that might fix this problem. Clear air, but I can't hear John. That's not good. But, um, but yeah, this, this Sensibo pure Wi-Fi controlled air How's purifier, that? much better. Yeah. I, I'm loving this, right. this, this air purifier here. It's, it's outstanding. Um, it, you know, easy to use and simple. So, yeah, I don't know why, I don't know why that, that crashed, but I'm glad that we're back in business. So let's see, I'm trying to pull up, uh, Sensibo's website here to, um, to find pricing and I'm, Evidently having other tech issues as well. There it is. Proceed. Yes. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, but I'll put a link in the show notes for, for you all. And this, like this thing, it's, it's easy. It, it monitors the airflow and monitors the particles that are in the air. And so it can decide when to ramp up. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's smarts or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's speed of the, the filter. I mean, air, Air purifiers are pretty simple devices. It's, it's a fan with a filter, right? And, and that's just, that's what it is. So uh, the real trick is, you know, how can it be smart about this? And, um, and that's what it is. So it's 129 bucks for this thing. Joins your Wi-Fi network. Uh, you can have it work with geo uh, location so that when you leave, it cranks up the thing and makes lots of noise, you know, and clears and purifies the air. But when you're in there, it's at like low mode, which is, well, let me tell you, it's been running 10 feet from me during this entire episode and none of us hear it. So I think that's a, that's a pretty good indication of how quiet this thing is. It's got to help a filter in it and all that stuff. So yeah, I was, I was pretty impressed with this thing and it stays on my Wi-Fi, which is even better. So there you go, John, what's next? What is next is flick. What's Flick, you ask? Um, uh, it's basically, a, we'll, we'll call it a smart button. Uh, we actually looked at it a number of years ago, but they've uh, they've been adding all sorts of features. So now we got Flick 2. Um, and uh, so there are three actions. You can press once, press twice, or hold down the button. And then it can do, it integrates with... Uh, over a thousand services, um, which are on your phone. So it kind of uses your phone as a hub. Um, and it also, uh, they, they added HID, which I believe is human interface device and MIDI control. So, uh, cool. If you want to do something at the push of a button, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is it. And then, and then they added, they also updated. Um, so instead of using your phone, they also have something that they call the flick hub. LR, which I think is long range. Okay. And this has uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.2, uh, their own low energy protocol, an Ethernet connector, uh, audio in and out, and uh, an IR output because you can connect an IR accessory, which uh, I think would let you uh, control pretty much anything that you control with your infrared remote. Yeah. So. Huh. Uh Pretty neat stuff. And they have all sorts of bundles and it's also in the article. So, cool. Uh, oh, sorry. Home, home kit support. <laughs> they added that. To, with the hub, right? They're, they're the flick hub or whatever is the thing that adds home kit support. Correct. That's awesome. Correct. Cool. So, uh, cool. All right. Cool. Uh, Robert's addition to cool stuff found this week is about wallpaper he says um i found this article while scrolling through the news app uh and i really like this whole idea about dynamic wallpapers um as i love this on my mac and it's about your iphone say the the title of the article which we'll link to it's a fast company article jazz up your iphone's boring home screen with this easy wallpaper trick uh and it is using wallpaper shortcuts to change your wallpaper on a you know semi-regular basis so yeah i thought that was pretty good Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing that with us, Walter. Pretty, it's a, it, they'll walk you through, uh, doing it there, but, um, but then, you know, you add shortcuts and add your, uh, 
you know, you can pull random photos or random por portrait photos or random wallpaper from an app or from an album. And so, yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Pretty good. Think about it, right? Shortcuts. Time of day. Your phone can do all this stuff in the background while you're sleeping, chewing up your battery. No, no, no. This wouldn't, this wouldn't be terrible for chewing your battery. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Robert. Fun. Um, in one of our CES related, there's a lot of CES meetings that are happening. I got to check out the uh, JBL has two new headphones that they have um, released. Actually, they've got several, uh, but the 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 ones that blew me away are in this tour line, right? It's a, it's a series of headphones that JBL is calling tour, and they've got two units in this. There's the tour. One, which is over the ear headphones. And then there's the Tor Plus, which are wireless earbuds. So these wireless earbuds, um, they've got JBL's hybrid adaptive noise cancellation, which is cool because it will it will balance its noise cancellation based on your environment. It's got uh, two microphones on the outside and one on the inside of your ears so that it can measure what the difference is and figure out all of that you know, noise stuff. They use dynamic drivers in these, which I really like. That's sort of my favorite for music. And they are, uh, they're 6.8 millimeter dynamic drivers, which is a decent size for an in-ear uh, phone. Six hours of playback with active noise canceling, eight hours of Bluetooth playback. And, uh, and they've, you know, they got the whole talk through thing so that you don't have to pull one out transparency mode apple calls theirs but yeah and and they've got a feature similar to what apple uses for the airpods to check your fit via the app to measure any air leakage again it can use those those microphones to check those out so that was cool and then the tour ones which are and i think the price on the uh tour plus is 199.95 tour pro plus sorry that the, those are the wireless ones and then the over the ear ones are the tour ones they cost 300 bucks 299 they have that same adaptive noise canceling, but you can add personal attributes to it and tweak what you want your environment to sound like, which is cool. 50 hours of playback time, uh, 25 with noise canceling and Bluetooth on, 50 hours with Bluetooth only. And they've got, speaking of Bluetooth, they've got this, I got to learn more about it. And I've got a, a, a call this week to, to learn more. And so I'll, if there's something to report, I will report it. But John, they have this smart audio mode that they say optimizes Bluetooth. And there's three modes. One is for normal listening. One is music mode. And then uh, one is l what they're calling a low latency video mode so that you don't get that, um, that that disconnect right between when you hear the sound and when you see the person speak that that is that plagues Bluetooth. Right. And so I'm very curious how they're doing this. I know there's a codec called Aptex low latency or Aptex LL, but both the, you know, the, the earphone, the headphones and the, the device transmitting to them need to support that for that codec to be there. So I don't know what the magic is. But um, but I'll find out. We'll 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 report back. So those are those are mine. Uh, you got one last one for us, John. One last one from MacTar. OK, <laughs> uh, all these companies I haven't heard of before. Um, and they have updated their QB product, Q-U-B-I-I, -I, and they now have the QB Pro. What does it do? Um, well, if you look at it, I mean, the concept's pretty straightforward. So one end is a USB-A connector that you plug into your charger. Uh, the other end is a USB-A receptacle, which you then plug your cable into, and then you plug in your phone. And then they have an SD card slot. Um, so it, it'll let you do a couple. Of, so it, it, what it does is, is it'll do automatic backup of uh, well, once you configure it. You just plug it in and it just sucks the data that you choose out of your phone and puts it on the memory card. Cool. Okay. So pass through. Um, it's faster than the predecessor and, it, and it's USB three. Um, okay. <clears throat> go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, so it's a, it's a pass through device that, 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 you know, you plug into your charger, you plug your phone into this and it, it sits there and, and we'll do the backup. I assume you install an app on your phone so that you can give it permission to back up to this thing and all of that. I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, they say yeah. automatic backup, but I assume that yeah. you have to, and, and there's, and I found their app on the app store. So sure. I think it's one time setup and then it'll 
automatically back up. But because it has a USB-A connector, um, oh, and this works also with the Files app. So you can oh. also use it to just shuttle data between your phone and your uh, computer nice. that has a USB-A port. So yeah, I think they have, I, I saw a hint of a USB-C version, but it looks like it's not quite available. But, okay. Um, that was going to be uh, my next question. This is, one is. Yeah. Are they, are they making one for USB-C? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Ah, pretty cool, man. Fun. All right. Sweet. All right. Um, well, I think that's almost everything. I think. Oh, I have one more cool stuff found, John. I was messing around with, well, mm -hmm. at the urging of listener Ben, uh, I was messing around on my, my MacBook Air, my M1 MacBook Air. I was answering some Mac Geekab questions there. And Ben's question was, hey, I know you guys have a Mac Geekab app for iPhone. Does that work on the M1 Air? And I thought, well, no better time to test than the present. So I went to the App Store, I downloaded it, and I ran it. And it works perfectly. So we have a Mac Geekab app for iPhone, iPad, and your M1 Max. And it works great in all of the above places. So you can get your so notifications. So did you, there. don't you have to do something special to publish uh, an app to the app store? Or it just came up when you searched for it? It came Mac? up when I searched for it. Yeah. And we haven't made an update in, you know, a, a little while anyway. So, yeah. I thought, yeah, I thought they said that you had to do, you, you had to flip a switch somewhere in order to... Uh, uh, Make that happen. I guess not. Okay. No, not for not for the M1 thing. If you wanted to use Project mm -hmm. Catalyst and and make a Mac app kind of like like Tripit did last year on Catalina for for Intel, then you would because you need to re you need to compile it for both ARM and in Intel. But because my Mac's an ARM Mac, it can just run them. You can flip a switch that says "Do not let Mac users download this." Like I think oh, I think right, YouTube right. did with their app for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, probably because they don't want you to be able to have your YouTube videos in a, you know, floating window or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's freaking YouTube. But anyway, um, at least not without paying for YouTube, you know, TV or YouTube Red or uh, whatever they call it these days. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, yeah, works great. Um, fun stuff. I'll have to see if my notification appeared there when I sent out the notification for the, uh, for the mm -hmm. episode today. So I'll, 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 I'll look. I'll, I don't have it here. It's only it's good that I only have one computer. I have enough trouble managing this. I gotta figure out how to make Memo Live more stable. I don't like that we're having like routine flakiness with that. I'm gonna send the crash logs in, but don't like it. I don't like it. It is good. Like it's a, it's a good app for what we do here, but I don't like that we have a common point of instability in our in our workflow for us or for you. But we're on it. We're geeks. It's what we do. It's what we do. You got anything else to add, John, before it's time to uh, pull the plug on this thing? No. Nope. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, I'd like to say thanks to everybody for listening. I would like to thank Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Uh, I would like to thank all of our premium subscribers. If you go to MacGeekUp.com slash premium, you can uh, learn all about that there. And, uh, and, 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 and while we're here, I'll take a minute and thank all of our recently contributing premium subscribers. Uh, we have two programs. Uh, uh, well, three. You can make a one-time contribution anytime you like. There's a monthly, uh, which defaults at $10 a month. And then there's uh, every six months, six months, which defaults to 25. But you, again, you can you can change those amounts. And we really appreciate it. It's not mandatory, uh, but you do get the ability to use the premium at MacGeekUp.com address when you send in your questions. And we prioritize those, although the secret is we really do try to get to everybody's questions. But we do prioritize the premium ones. So thanking. And you get that warm, fuzzy feeling of helping us pay the bills. That's it. It is a warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> oh, that's, 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 you're, you're not wrong about this. Uh, th so thank you to Frank in Philadelphia, Richard in Sands Point, Jeffrey from Alamogordo, Steve from Woodland Hills, Harvey from Washington, Mark from South Orange, Craig from Putney, Stephen from Costa Mesa, Everett from Marina. I don't think he's in Marina. I think he's in Colorado. Olga from Bellevue, Michael from Naperville, Richard from Pontrug, Mary from Monterey, Jason from Charlestown, Jason from St. Louis, 
Michael from Troy, Norton from Bethesda, William from Hattiesburg, Edward from Crum, Gerard from Meridian, Craig from I'm Not Sure Where, and also Joel from I'm Not Sure Where, Larry from Alpharetta, Dan from I'm Not Sure Where, Paul from Fishers, Mark from Milford, John from I'm Not Sure Where, Tony from I'm Not Sure Where, Gary from Babylon, David from Ranchos de Taos, Neil from West Hartford, Lou from Albuquerque, Richard from Quakertown, Abel from Santa Rosa, Ron G, Peter from Auburn, Bruce from Alpharetta, Paula from Half Moon Bay, Bob Dr. Mac working smarter for Mac users, Levitus from Austin, John from Vivi. I'm not sure where Vivi is. That's a different country in uh, Switzerland, maybe? I think so. Vevi, could be. James from San Antonio. Abdullah from Reisterstown. Greg from Los Angeles. Thank you to all of you. You rock. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing the show with all of your friends. That really is a helpful thing. So uh, if we could ask one thing of you this week, it would be to do that. And that's what I got. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Of course, the sponsors we mentioned in the episode, TwoBird.com. Go check that out. Headspace.com slash MGG. I love what they're doing there. Audible.com slash MGG. Amazon.com slash MGGRX. Of course, all of our ongoing sponsors like MaxSales.com, SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Barebones.com, Eero.com slash MGG, Linode.com slash MGG. Good times. Thanks for listening. It's a fun one. Dave, you yes, got John. us in. You got to get us out. Oh, okay. So I got to come up with one more thing, huh? I already I already said uh, all the gear, but no idea. Oh, I know. Have fun out there. Make sure you're kind to your neighbors. And everybody, really, if you could be. And then uh, don't get caught. Be safe. Have fun. Made up.